Hi, welcome to week five. We're going to be talking about build automation and build tools. This video is an introduction to that topic. I'm Tom Horton, professor in the computer science department at the University of Virginia. So let's get started. The overview of what we're going to do is this. First, we're going to talk about what we mean by build automation and build tools and why we need that. We're going to sort of give you a quick overview of some commonly used build tools. You're going to be doing a second video where you see a specific language and tool combination used, and there'll be a demo for that. So we're going to give you some information for that demo. And that same information will be useful for the exercise that you'll do as your weekly assignment after you've completed this video and the video on the specific language and tool. So let's talk about what build automation, automation and build tools are all about. What problem do they solve? First, let's talk about how you've been building and running software up until now. In your earlier classes, you've written programs, of course, and you've run them. That's kind of the whole point. You want to write software so that you or maybe someone else can run it. But some things have to happen to make this possible. Now, in an IDE, um, you're probably used to sort of finding this green play button, clicking on that, or maybe finding something under the run menu. And just clicking on something and, and having the magic happen, having your program run, execute, show you any errors, and produce any output it might um, generate. Maybe you've learned some things about what goes on behind the scenes. Maybe if you're taking a course in C++, you've learned that there's something called compiling that happens, that checks for errors in your syntax, and if there are none, turns your code into something closer to what the machine can execute. In the C++ situation, it turns into what are called object files. And you might remember, if you've done C++, that those object files are then combined together in a process called linking, which also combines it with any kind of libraries that are needed to produce an executable file that can run on your native hardware, the actual hardware of your machine. For Java, compiling happens also. We look for errors, and if there are none, we create what are called .class files. And these are going to be run not um, directly on the machine, but through something called the Java Virtual Machine, or runtime environment that interprets the instructions in the .class file. Maybe you learned that you can combine class files into what's called a jar file, and that can be executed in a, in a way. Um, possibly you saw the use of third-party libraries, where you've um, taken some library that you found on the web, or your instructor's given you, and you've compiled it, or in the case of Java, you've got a jar file, and you sort of integrated that in with your execution so that your program compiled with that and then ran and used the code in that third party library. And you might have seen how to do all of these things on the command line or you may have learned how to do them from the IDE. But one of the points we want to make is your IDE, like PyCharm or IntelliJ or Eclipse, whatever you're using, um, hides a lot of details and they make it very easy for beginners to sort of run and build, build and run a program. They're also great for uh, experts, of course. And if we need to change any of these things, there's always a way of doing this within the IDE. But IDEs hide a lot of complexity. Well, <clears throat> running a program, building a program, and then running it can be a little bit more complicated than that. And there's some things that um, may be a little trickier if you just stick with that pressing the green button attitude. So what if you're working in a team and team members are using different IDEs? Someone's using Eclipse, someone's using IntelliJ or PyCharm, and you all need to build the program the same way. Or maybe someone's using the command line. What if um, you need to distribute your code to others? You can't sort of insist that they use whatever IDE you've used and give them instructions for that, and you don't want to sort of write instructions for every possible IDE. And then this is one you probably haven't thought of. A lot of times code needs to be run on a server up somewhere on the internet, and so it needs to be uploaded and then built automatically on that server. Um, and clearly you can't run an IDE on someone else's server. So what we need is a, something called build automation. And the de definition for that is an automated process for creating a software build and doing that, uh, and also doing related tasks like test testing or packaging, these kinds of things. So what do I mean by a software build? I mean just a, a fully constructed version of your software that can be run and executed. So one of the points here is that, that um, there's multiple things we might want to do. We might want to build it, we might want to build and run it, we might want to test it, and we need it to be automated. We want to be able to repeat this and um, maybe run it as a script, maybe run it on a server. So there's a Wikipedia page there which has a sort of general overview on build automation. You might want to check that out. It's got details on specific tools, but we'll give you an overview of how this works here in this video lecture. So 
there's some things that we need to worry about. There's a reason build tools exist. They need to handle certain kinds of issues that come up when we try to build a large software system. And so this slide tries to list a number of those. First, um, building a software system often depends on the version of the compiler or interpreter you're using to actually build and run the software. So your program may be using Java 8, but someone else is using Java 11. It's not unusual at all for Python to have to build a system using an older version, Python 2. But the newer versions, Python 3, are also used. And you might be working on multiple projects on your computer that use different versions of a compiler. So that's a little tricky, and we need to control that. One thing you may not have seen at all is that there are options we can supply to the compiler when it does its compiling work or we can supply when we actually run the program. And this is different for different languages. But here's some examples of that. Again, you may not have seen any of these. Uh, one, compilers can optimize. They can sort of try to change your code in ways to make it run more efficient. And you can toggle that on or off. Secondly, there are things called environment settings or environment variables, things that are set at runtime when you run your program. And they're referenced from within your program with variables or with library calls. And um, this is one way of sort of configuring your program to do certain things at runtime without having to recompile it. And so you might, for example, have the name or location of a configuration file defined as a, a, through, a through an environment setting. Another thing that might happen is your program may need to run in a certain directory. We call that the working directory because maybe there's some data files there. Maybe the program assumes that some image files are there that it uses. And finally, um, if you've done programming before with recursion, you'll, you'll remember that you call a function, which calls itself, which might call itself. And there might be a, a sort of long series of nested function calls. You might remember that each one of those stores some memory on what's called the runtime stack. It has to store the local variables and what the return address is. And if you write a recursion that goes really, really deep, that amount of memory can grow and grow and grow. And so programs have a limit on, on what's called the runtime stack size. And if um, you exceed that, your program will halt. But maybe your program really needs to do some deep recursion. And so maybe you need to increase the size of that runtime stack. So again, those are all examples. But the point is, is that um, you'll see when you start looking at build tools in any depth that they have ways of supplying these kinds of options. <clears throat> well, when you have a large uh, software system, it's going to be made up of a lot of source files, a lot of Java, Python, C++ files. And often you organize these into some kind of directory structure with subdirectories and sub subdirectories. And you do this for reuse, for making it logical, for ease of testing. And so that's something that is important when you try to build your program. Third party libraries or packages, as they're called in Python, which one are you using? What versions are they? Where do I find them? How do I? locate them on my system and include them in this build. I talked about jar files earlier, so often there's different types of executables you can generate, and maybe it needs to be installed somewhere on a user's computer. And so you want this automated build system to be able to sort of do that. And test code, uh, you'll see later on, we'll, we're in a later lecture, we'll, we'll teach you about testing. Uh, it's important to sort of develop test code as you're building a system and run it consistently. Um, so these are all things that you need to handle. And some of these are things that need to be repeated by yourself uh, and shared with others. And so having a, an automation system to manage this is really important for large systems. So we need some tool support. And um, for build automation, I'll, I'll start off talking about what I'll call the control file. That's just kind of my term for um, a generic term for lots of different systems. But every, many, many, many of these systems have some kind of text file that you create that specifies what settings you need, what libraries you need to include, all the things you need to make happen to build the system. <coughs> you also then need a, a utility program, we call a build tool, that uses that file that carries out those needed tasks. So the, the build tool always has some kind of specification or control file. Um, not all build tools do this. Some include it and some have it separate and some don't do it at all. Uh, but ideally, it'd be nice to have what's called a package manager. And a package manager is a tool that finds libraries on some uh, server on the internet and downloads those for use in our project and installs them in the, in the right place and makes them really easy to add to our build. So we don't have to sort of figure that out and do it by hand. We just say, hey, we want this library. And presto, it's part of our build. And then ideally, we'd also like to use tools that work on many, many different computer systems so that no matter 
what kind of system our team is using or other users who want to download our software are using, they can take advantage of these build tools. We definitely don't want to write our own. And also we'd like, like it to be something that's integrated into integration into an IDE. So the ones we're going to show you in this unit all sort of play nicely with the most common IDEs like Eclipse and uh, IntelliJ and PyCharm and things like that. Okay, so just to repeat what we've talked about, the reason we need build automation is it gives us these advantages of one, repeatability. I, the programmer, can define this, this control file and I can build consistently over a period of time. You know, if I'm working on a project for five, six, eight months, um, I don't have to sort of remember all the settings. I just hit, I just type my build command and it builds. Uh, and I can share that with my team. If we're all working on the same project, we all need to be able to build the project in the same way. Uh, I can then distribute that as part of my software release. So when people find it on GitHub or some other place, they can build the system themselves without me having to explain how. And finally, if it gets uploaded to a server, say something in the cloud or something doing testing, continuous integration, um, <clears throat> that server can use this build system and my control file to create the executable program. Okay, so I alluded to this before, but, but um, when we see a large software project, a sort of realistic software project, it's more complicated than the code you've been developing so far, probably. I mentioned there are many source files, could be hundreds, could be thousands, organized possibly into some complicated directory structure. But in addition to that, there may be other things, other files that are needed by this program. These could be images or configuration files or data files, and we refer to those as assets or resources, and they often live in one or more directories. We talked about the need for libraries or packages to build our system. Um, we also might have this control file for our build tool system testing files and test data plus documentation. All these things together make up all the files in our software project. And they all could be under version control. You probably are using Git to sort of determine versions and you might have the whole thing stored online in GitHub or something like that. So um, build tools have to work with this entire complex uh, set of files to actually create our system. Okay, so we're going to have a look at a couple of uh, common well-known build tools for different languages. If you need a break, this is a good time to take one. Take a break, come back. Um, we're about halfway through this intro lecture. All right, let's assume you're ready to carry on. Um, we'll start off with tools for C and C++, and we'll start off with the granddaddy of them all, I'll call it. There's a tool called Make that's been around as long as C has been around, which is a long time, 70s, 1970s. <laughs> and Make is a, um, really well known. It's the one most people think of when they think of a build tool. Uh, there's lots of older programmers who don't know there's something similar for other languages, so uh, you'll be ahead of them after this lecture. How does Make work? Well, this control file is called a Make file, and the Make file um, defines what are called targets. A target is just a name you give something, and with each of those target names, you associate a shell, a set of uh, commands that would execute as if they were running in a command line prompt on your computer in the bash shell on Linux or the Mac OS or uh, Windows commands that would run run on a Windows machine. And so you might call a target say compile and that would be all the commands that compile. You might have another um, another um, target called link that would link things together and you might have something called build which calls compile and compile calls link and does all of that at the same time. So um, lots of targets, lots of sets of commands. Um, so make is fine, except it's got some disadvantages. It's, it's um, one of its big disadvantages is that the commands that go into the make file are written for a specific computer system, the one you're on, which means it's not portable. You can't take, say, your make file for a Windows machine and move it over to a, a, a Macintosh machine. Um, so it'd be nice to have some kind of way of specifying all these things that were not machine specific. Also, the format of the makefile is, is old and ugly and awkward. You have to use tabs and not spaces. And if you get things wrong, things kind of blow up. But make is, is sort of everywhere. Everyone knows it and it's on any machine that comes with C and C++. It's very flexible, of course, because you can associate any kind of command with any kind of target. So you can make do all kinds of things. <clears throat> but how do we avoid some of these problems? Um, one tool that's been around a while that tries to improve on make is called CMake, and that's what we're going to do in this course when you get to the next video that shows you how to do 
build tools with C++, C makes the one we're going to show you. The, the control file is higher level. The commands are are more sort of general. They say things like, like here's a library we want to use, go use it, instead of uh, the actual commands that link in the library that you would type at the terminal. Um, so it's more portable. Uh, it's kind of interesting. The design decision they made was to, to interpret this file, this control file, and then generate a make file. So CMake sort of sits on top of make, and you run CMake to sort of generate a make file, and then you run make on the make file that's been generated. So it's kind of a two-step process. Okay, what if you live in the world of Java? Well, there's a whole bunch of tools here, build tools, and we're going to look at two, two important ones. Uh, the second one is the one we're actually going to use, Gradle, but we'll talk about Maven first because Gradle is sort of influenced a lot by Maven. Um, Maven is sort of used for Java and similar languages that run on the JVM. The thing that made Maven really interesting to me when I first learned it was it includes a package manager. It will find and download libraries that you say you need from a server. And there's lots of, of Maven package servers are out there on the internet. So you just specify which one you want to look at and lo and behold, all of your libraries appear. Um, well, uh, Maven also has a very powerful language for its control file. It can support very complex operations, but there's a couple of issues with this, especially for beginners. It's pretty complicated. Uh, the kinds of operations you can do are, are, are not as straightforward to understand as they are for Gradle, which we'll look at next. Um, so it's hard for beginners. Um, it seems a little bit like magic, like a black box. A lot of stuff is sort of predefined. Also, the control file is written in a language called XML, which is a very powerful language, but again, it's a little bit hard to read for beginners. So Maven's a big tool. It's pretty popular, but a lot of people want something a little simpler and a little uh, easier to understand. And Gradle falls into that category. It's also used a lot in industry for Java and related languages. Simpler than Maven has the package manager features of Maven. In fact, it can pull packages from the exact same uh, servers on the internet. And so we're going to look at Gradle. Uh, the control files are easier to write and easier to understand. It really is used in the real world. It's not just some off the wall thing. It's used particularly for Android development. So any Java application that's going to run on an Android phone has to be um, built with Gradle. Python. Python's a little bit different. It doesn't need the same kind of build tool that the other two languages use because it's interpreted. With Python, when you run a Python program, you just simply call Python on the, the file that has your starting point, and away Python goes. But some of those same problems exist that we talked about before for Python, and two tools are used to sort of address those. One is a package manager called pip. And so pip, again, like Maven, um, will download and install packages, which is what Python calls libraries, from the internet uh, and make them available for your program. Um, but that's all it does. PIP only is a package manager, and that's okay. Does it well? We often use it in collaboration with something called a virtual environment. And so this is kind of a strange idea, but um, it's pretty common in, in complex software development. We often want to build and run a program using a specific um, a specific compiler and a specific set of libraries. And what we want to do is bundle those together into, into this environment, what we call a virtual environment, that can be used just by that project. And then while we're working on that project, we'll use that virtual environment. And when we're done, we can uh, we'll call what we deactivated that environment and switch to another one and then use another set of packages. So it's like having different versions of your languages and the libraries your language use on your computer and be able to switch back and forth between them. And so for something like Python, where there's many different versions, 2.5, 2.6, 2.8, 3.7, 3.8, and people are sort of building things that have to run in one of these, these versions, it's really great. Um, it also avoids you having to sort of install packages for your entire system, for all of your um, projects. You can just limit packages for one project. So in Python, what we do typically is we create a virtual environment and then activate it so that we're working with that. Then we call pip to sort of download the packages we need just for that um, virtual environment. Let me say one more thing about package managers before I go on. It's a really powerful idea. And so um, if you're a Linux user, you'll know about apt-get. And if you don't, I'll explain what it does. Um, 
AppGit is a program for Linux, which which is a package manager not just for third-party libraries for programming, but for all applications. So if you need a new compiler, you call app get, and it goes and finds it on the internet and installs it. If you need Gradle, uh, you call app get, and it pulls it off the internet and installs it. And later on, if there's a new version, you, you call upgrade with app get, and it gets you the newest version. And so this is core to how we use Linux, and other systems have these things too. They're third-party products usually. They don't usually come from the computer manufacturer. So for example, for the Macintosh, there's a utility called Homebrew, which is really great for installing things and managing stuff. And if you're a Mac user, I strongly encourage you to look for Homebrew. Under Windows, things are a little messier. Uh, Microsoft or no one else provided one that was great until recently. Microsoft has just released something called WinGet, which is um, just a lot, a lot like apt-get. Uh, and it's sort of in final experimental phase. Before that, people used a third-party package manager called Chocolatey. All right, so package managers are wonderful for keeping software up to date on your system. Other languages have package managers for libraries, like the language Node.js. Node.js is a JavaScript kind of language, and its package manager is called NPM. So really, any modern language you see coming on down the road is going to come with a package manager. All right, so where are we? Um, in this introductory video, you're now at a point where you have a general idea of what we mean by build automation and what build tools are and uh, what that's all about and why we need these things. So we want you now to go watch a video, one of our follow-up videos that, that take a language and a tool combination and, and sort of demo how this works. Uh, we want you to watch at least one. You got to pick one because we want you to do an exercise using that tool with the language of your choice. So if you're a Python user, and you want to do this assignment in Python and maybe future assignments in Python, pick the Python video. So you pick. If you want to do more than one of these, we welcome you to. It'd be great to learn, if you know more than one language, learning how to use this kind of tool in more than one language would be really valuable for you. So if you're using Java or C++, your build tool that we're going to use probably isn't installed, so you're probably going to need to uh, download and install that build tool. Python. PIP comes built in with Python, and if virtual ENV is not there, that's the virtual environment tool we're going to use. If virtual VNV is not there, PIP will install it for you. If you run into any kind of issues installing or finding or making these tools work, post, ask the students, ask, ask us, and we'll answer your questions. So there's going to be a demo you'll see in, in this video, and then there'll be an exercise you'll need to do, and we'll provide information on that separately. So at this point, I want to step back and sort of tell you what you'll know once you've done all this, once you've watched the videos and done the demo and done the exercise, where will you be? What can you sort of say you've learned? Um, well, several things. These are things you could put on your resume maybe. You've got basic knowledge of the following or talk about it in an interview. You'll know what build automation is, what its goals are, why it's important, why it matters in, in uh, realistic software development. And of course, any company looking to hire you is going to Hope you know a lot about that, but at the very least, they're going to want you to know a, that you know that it's what's there, what's, what the issues are. Since you've done the exercise, you'll know the basic workflow for using a build tool in development, because because um, there's really sort of a sort of series of steps you go through with a build tool to sort of make things work. That's a little bit different than just press it, pressing the green play button. You'll have introductory knowledge of how to use one particular build tool for one language. So that'll be useful. You know, you're not going to be an expert, but you can say, I, I've done Java and Gradle or whichever pair you pick. In doing this, you'll have worked with third party libraries, which is very, very common in larger projects. And certainly people who are looking at you for jobs and internships will hope that you'll have seen something like that. You won't have a lot of experience after this, but you'll understand the basic issues of how to integrate them in, how to get the right version, things like that. And then one final thing is logging, and I'll talk about that in a second. We, that's one of the things we're making you do in this exercise, um, and we'll sort of say why we're doing that in a moment. So again, you won't be experts in all of these things, but you'll have some basic knowledge. And when you see these things later on, you'll have a head start. You'll know what they are, and you'll have had a little bit of experience with this. And in the meantime, if you talk to uh, someone from industry about, a, about a, an internship or something like that, you'll be able to sort of talk about things you've learned for large-scale software development that are important. So, like I said, you're going to pick a video uh, for one of the three languages. If you took C++, you'll be doing CMake. If you took Java, you'll be doing Gradle. If you took Python, you'll be doing PIP and virtual ENV. 
And in these demos, uh, we have the same, in these videos, we have the same demo program. We sort of came up with the idea of one program that does some matrix operations using a matrix library, a third party matrix library. And we're doing a little bit of logging, partly because the, it lets us show some of you how to add yet another third party library. But also logging is kind of important in its own right. It's something else you can talk about um, in an interview that you know what logging is and why it matters. All right, so um, let's talk about logging for a second. By, by the way, matrix operations, we're gonna just like add two matrices together and print the answer. So it's nothing very sophisticated at all. Our demo program is really small. It's just to, to sort of show how third party libraries can be incorporated into your build. So let's say a little bit about logging for a second. Um, logging is related to something you might have heard of called DevOps. If you've heard of DevOps, that stands for um, Development Operations. Is that right? I think that's right. Uh, and that's the sort of notion of issues. That's all about issues surrounding uh, installing and running and administering software after it's been built. Okay, so it's really focused on, on the operations on the running. And so when I talk about deployed software in a moment, um, that's this is where logging sort of intersects with DevOps. So um, your programs probably print things out. You probably do C out and C++ and print and Python and system.out.println and Java. And where does that output go? Well, it goes to the console. It pops up on the screen in front of you. It appears in a little window. But you know what? A lot of software in the real world doesn't have a little window to print stuff in. Uh, it doesn't run in an IDE or a shell window. For example, look at your phone. You might be looking at your phone right now because that's what people do when they're watching videos and listening to professors. Um, you're running some software on your phone. If something goes wrong or, or the, code, the programmer wanted to say something and they printed, where, where would it show up? There's no console. Software runs on servers. Uh, it runs in embedded systems, which means it runs in like cars and um, and wireless routers and thermostats and all kinds of things. There's no place to sort of print messages in systems like that, but we still need to communicate sometimes. So deployment, when software is actually deployed and being used in the real world, it may need to sort of put out status messages that show what's going on and what time it is. Um, and those status messages are collected somewhere off, usually in a file because whoever's administering this running software may need to review that to sort of see what went wrong or see what the load is or, or see what's happening. So they need to, to sort of read that or search that or filter that because uh, there may be a lot of these status messages. So deployed software has got to generate output. And then even before we deploy it, while we're developing it, you, the programmer, you may want to print things out that, that are a little bit more sophisticated than just some message. You may want to add a level to it that shows whether you think it's a, an error or a warning or it's just general information and where this was located. So the point is, is that that printing to the console is, is a nice basic idea, but we need to get a little bit more sophisticated for, than a, use a more sophisticated way of doing that for larger, more complicated programs that run in the real world. So what's the solution? Uh, logging. A logging utility, nothing to do with chainsaws or trees or anything like that. It's just a way of of generating output status messages during execution. Um, the utility is flexible in that we can do things like support the level of the output message. By that we mean, is it a high priority or low priority? Uh, the format, like does it have a timestamp? These kinds of things, whether it's written to a file or some other place. So logging utilities is what we use to do that. So they're not hard. Let me just show you an example of some of, of logs that explain what they are and why they were useful. So this is a, a log from a web server, uh, from the Apache web server, in fact. And um, I, I don't know if you know how much, if you know much about how the web works, but when I'm in a browser and I type HTTP colon slash slash some host name, some web page name, the web browser says, oh, I'm gonna go talk to that machine out on the internet. And at the other end of that machine, that machine is listening for a, a, a a message coming in, a command coming in. The software that's listening is, is called a web server. And that web server gets the, the communication and that it does something. Maybe it executes something, maybe it just retrieves a file, but it sends information back to the browser, which then displays that information. That's sort of the simplest view. So the web server is the thing listening for commands from web browsers. 
And so um, this Apache, this is the log for a web server. You can imagine the web server sits there and runs and gets lots of requests. And so whoever's administering that web server might want to know, hey, what caused it to crash? Who was looking at what page when it crashed? Um, wh who's been contacting us? Uh, what's the most popular pages that have been accessed? And so every time there's an access to the web server, a, a message gets written to this log. So in this, in this browser, you can see um, the host name that's connecting, that's the IP address, the timestamp of when it was connected, and then the HTTPS command that was that was sent to the web browser. And so in this case, it's just recording what messages got sent. So again, someone administering this, this web server might be looking at those logs. Here's another example of a log, not from a server, but from a, a Java program that somebody wrote. And this person who wrote this used the same um, logging library that we're gonna use called log4j. And again, you can see um, like there's no IP address because it's, it's output from the program, but you can see there's a timestamp. And then in the middle here, you can see there's a levels. There's debug and warn and trace. And so whenever this programmer um, wanted to write a message, they said, I'm gonna write it with this level. And then here's the string I wanna put out. So these are messages generated just like you would if you were gonna print stuff to system.out.println in Java or stream to C out in, in C++. Um, so these are our, uh, my messages, my, if I'm the programmer, these are my messages with a timestamp, with a label. And you might think, well, why is this better or worse than just printing stuff out? Well, one, um, the levels are there. And most logger libraries have a way of letting you control what level you see. You might run it and say, I don't want to see the debug messages. I only want to see the error and the warnings and the things that are more serious. So you can control which messages you see and which you don't. And most of your programs run and they do something and they quit. But again, programs we write that are more sophisticated will run a long time. They might have lots of user input and um, it can get really complicated um, if you sort of have lots of print statements. So again, a log statement lets you sort of uh, record all that in a way that you can go back and analyze it better later on. So two versions of logs. Um, I mentioned in Java, we'll be using a third party library called log4j. This is the second second version of that. Um, it's developed by a, an organization called Apache. So it's a third party library, it's out there. Hey, we don't have to worry about where to find it because Gradle's gonna download it and include it in our bill. You're gonna see, if you're a Java user, you'll see how sweet it is to use uh, third party libraries with a build tool like Gradle. For C++, we're gonna be using a different um, library for logging, one called plog or plog. I'm not sure how you say it. I'll, call it, I'll say it plog, it sounds funnier. Uh, it's not the most commonly used one, but it worked well under Windows and the Macintosh and it installed very easily. So we picked it for this course. Um, you know what? The C++ package manager CMake, does, sorry, the C++ build tool called CMake does not have a package manager. So this is sad if you're a C++ user. It's not as nice as Python and Java you have to download that library yourself from GitHub and install it as a subdirectory of your project. And then we'll show you how to then make um, CMake recognize it and find it and include it into your system when you build it. Python, you guys are the lucky ones because Python's newer than these other two languages and logging has been recognized as something that's important and necessary. And so Python has its own logging utility, part of its standard packages. So nothing to sort of set up for Python. So again, just to mention this, why are we showing you logging? Well, you know, for two of you, Java and C++, we wanted you to get more experience downloading libraries and using them with your build tool. Um, but logging is used for large projects and it's used a lot in industry. And again, it's one more thing that, that um, you now sort of know about. And um, if someone, again, in an interview says, how is, um, how is um, large scale software do you have any experience or do you know anything about large scale software? You can say, yeah, I've, I've learned a little bit about logging, how that's important. I've learned about how build tools are necessary. Um, so it's one more thing you can sort of talk about in your interviews or on your resume. So that's it. We want you to sort of go forth now and, and do the next video to see the demo about how to use some of these tools. Um, so go forth and learn more about software build automation. All right, have a great day. Good luck with everything.